What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat BDGE Fantasy Football Must Own Quarterbacks. We're talking quarterbacks. We've done almost no quarterback talk this summer, but today's video, we're gonna go over, we're gonna cover the position entirely and my thoughts on the strategy behind it, as well as some of my favorite guys throughout the drafts. I will preface this by saying all of the leagues that I play in are super flex. All of the leagues that I personally throw down in are super flex leagues, meaning you're starting two quarterbacks in those leagues. Today's video, though, I will cover one quarterback leagues. I will cover super flex leagues. I'll try to just give you the guys that I like that you can probably target in both aspects. But I want to make this a little bit of a strategy video as well, because I do see some trends. I do see some places to squeeze the value out of these quarterbacks. I'm filming this on a Sunday, so we're going to keep the noise to a minimum. Just tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. The quarterback position, it's actually a fun one to kind of break down when you when you go through the intricacies of it, right? Because you have the top tier of Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes. Them two have occupied the NFL MVP slot for the last two seasons. Lamar Jackson most recently. Ooh, today's going to be a tough video to get through. Lamar Jackson most recently. Patrick Mahomes most second recently. So MVP candidates. The quarterback one and the quarterback two off the board. The question becomes, how early do you target these two in one quarterback leagues? First off, they are top five, top eight at worst. You know, maybe your league fades quarterbacks a little bit in super flex leagues. They are very worthy of the first round pick. I myself tend to operate in other positions. I tend to go running back heavy in the first couple of rounds. So I will not end up with Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes on the high, high majority of my teams. We have come around to this aspect of 2020 fantasy drafts where <clears throat> everyone seems to be adopting this running back early strategy. One running back in first round, second running back in the second round. I'm going to do an entire video, I think, on just overall draft strategy, which is basically the big dogs got to eat Bible, which I publish every single year in the draft guide, which is about 10,000 words, exactly how to attack your draft position by position. I'm going to do like a light version of that in an actual video. But for the quarterbacks, since we're seeing this overwhelming majority of running backs start to take over the first couple rounds, if you do pick from like the one, two or three hole, you tend to see yourself in a position at the end of the second round, early third round, where there's not a lot of value to be had, right? You're probably reaching for a running back that you don't want. Like no one feels good about taking Leonard Fournette or Chris Carson or Jonathan Taylor or anyone like that at the end of the second round and barely not even in the beginning of the third round. So it becomes a problem. And all the top wide receivers tend to be off the board as well. So you're staring at the decision like, do I take a Chris Godwin? Do I take a DeAndre Hopkins or do I take a Lamar Jackson? And to be honest, I'm, I'm sort of coming around to the notion that if I have the 211, if I have the 212, the 3132, and all of the top running backs are off the board and you're left with like these mid-tier wide receiver two or mid-tier wide receiver ones, late wide receiver ones that have some question marks around them coming around to the idea of taking Lamar Jackson there because it's one of those picks that you're not going to regret, right? Like we could throw out all the numbers and say like value over replacement, this guy, you know, running backs are league winners. But when you're at the point where all the running backs that are potential league winners are off the board, we just had a season where Lamar Jackson in terms of points over replacement value player was just as valuable as Christian McCaffrey was becomes a question like maybe Lamar Jackson is the right pick and again you're not going to regret it the reason I regret taking Lamar Jackson in the mid to early second round is because I don't want to take a Lamar Jackson over a Josh Jacobs because those guys are not attainable later in the draft whereas if you take a guy like a Chris Godwin there or like a DJ Moore there. Not that they're attainable later on in the drafts, but you can get really, really, really solid startable wide receivers in the fourth, fifth, sixth round. And you could do the same thing with the quarterback. But Lamar Jackson is a once in a lifetime kind of player, right? Like he's not someone that we're going to see typically come around and have the sort of weekly upside that Lamar Jackson brings, like legitimate league winning, week winning upside every single time he steps on the field. You don't see that at the quarterback position too much. So we could throw all the analytics out there. But at the end of the day, I don't think you're really going to hate Lamar 
Lamar Jackson pick. But if one of the top running backs falls to you, or, you know, if like Tyree Kill with his hamstring news falls to you at the end of the second round, like you're going to take him over a guy like Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is the unquestioned QB1 here over Patrick Mahomes. In Dynasty, it might be a different story, but Lamar Jackson, I'm okay with there. Otherwise, the rest of the guys start to fade back into that second tier of quarterbacks where you have Dak Prescott, Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, and Russell Wilson. And I think there's value to be had here, to be honest with you. I'm not, I don't feel very strongly about one or the other. What I will say quickly is for me, you see a lot of Dak and Kyler Murray in like the second tier. And then you see Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson together in like a, it's like a 2A, 2B tier. I've done a lot of best ball drafts on underdog fantasy. And it's always typically the same thing. It's like Dak and Kyler go off the board in the sixth round. And Deshaun Watson, and Russell Wilson go off the board in the seventh round. So it's almost like pairs of two. So you have Mahomes and Lamar Jackson, second, third round. You have Kyler, Dak in like the sixth. And then Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson in the seventh. And I'm here to say like, I don't typically like to target mid-tier quarterbacks but I think that's more speaking to the point of the guys like the Matt Ryans the Josh Allens the Drew Breeses the Tom Brady's where they don't have the upside that the elite guys do but when you look at a guy like Dak Prescott I mean he threw for almost 5,000 passing yards last year so he does have the passing upside you know an underrated passing upside similar to a Patrick Mahomes and you look at the other runners like Kyler Murray, not going to get anywhere near what Lamar Jackson did on the ground, but he'll be the second leading rusher amongst quarterbacks this year, most likely. So a combination of those second tier quarterback guys present you like a legitimate floor and ceiling argument to Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes when we're talking about end of year statistical numbers, right? So I think there's a lot of value to be had in that mid-tier quarterbacks because those guys have kind of separated themselves, showing that they do have parts of their game that can be elite, where Mahomes and Lamar Jackson also post those kind of numbers. And I've made this point many times. Like if you're in a super flex league, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes go off the board in the first round. A lot of the times you see Kyler and Dak and Deshaun Watson also go off the board in the late first round. Like they're usually five, six, seven, maybe 10-ish picks behind Lamar and Patrick Mahomes in a super flex redraft league but in a one quarterback league they go four or five six rounds later than the other quarterbacks so I think there's this discrepancy there where we're starting to devalue the one quarterback high-end quarterbacks almost too much to the point where I would love to take a Dak in the sixth round I would love to take a Deshaun Watson or Russell Wilson in the seventh round especially when the guys like Matt Ryan are going off the board like one round later where like yeah he could you know he's someone who's been he's been consistent but not high-end ceiling consistent like he's had like one really, really, you know, that MVP year. But in terms of like passing yardage and passing touchdowns, like they fluctuate a lot. I just don't think he has the solidified ceiling that a guy like Russell Wilson has. Pass attempts are down, but he's thrown for 30 passing touchdowns year in and year out. Last three years, like we talk about, oh, touchdown rate has to come down. It's like, nah, Russell Wilson is just really fucking good. So he's going to continue to put up those touchdowns regardless of the number of pass attempts that he has. And, you know, what if they let Russ cook? Pete Carroll came out and he said, you know, we're going to fucking ground and pound and ground and pound. And he was joking about it. But like, eventually he's got to hear the whispers coming into his ear. Like he's got to be weary about his job, most likely. Right. Like you have Russell Wilson, one of the top quarterbacks of all time, and you are not producing at a level that's conducive of having one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. So maybe he is going to start hearing us yelling at him and chirping and screaming. Again, I'm not going to yell because it's Sunday, but maybe he starts to hear those whispers and maybe he starts to let Russ cook a little bit. So my strategy, typically, unless I'm in a really tough spot where I have a 211, 212, and there's no one I love on the board, I'm not going to hate picking Lamar Jackson there. Otherwise, I'm fading Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, if there's a guy that I like more at that spot. And then if I'm in a one quarterback league, I'm probably looking to target mid-round positional backs in the seventh round, whatever one of those four honestly fall to the seventh round. And I think people are getting like almost unnecessarily high on Kyler Murray. Like he's being drafted as a quarterback three or four when all these other guys have already finished as the quarterback one, two, three in their careers, when Kyler were just projecting this massive uptick in volume and efficiency and production, when last year he wasn't really that good as a passer, and they went extremely run heavy over the second half of the year. Once Kenyon Drake came over to the Cardinals, the Cardinals turned into the 29th pass heaviest team in the NFL. So they were throwing the ball at the fourth fewest number of times per game. It's not a good thing for Kyler Murray, of course. So I think, yes, you do want to catch the wave before it crashes, and that's true with a guy like Kyler Murray, but I also think there is something to be said when you have all this proven talent around the same draft position that we've already seen do it and seen do it very, 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 very recently. So I think value is to be had in those second tier, mid round, sixth, seventh round quarterbacks of the quarterback one position, but some people want to fade it. When I look at Superflex, like the way I'm going to be attacking drafts this year in Superflex is I'm more of a quantity over quality type of guy. And obviously you have to put perspective behind quality. I don't mean 
straight up quantity in terms of like, okay, you know, I'm just going to fade quarterback and I'm going to take Justin Herbert, Tyrod, Mitchell Trubisky, Nick Foles, Big Ben, Sam Darnold, Drew Locke. Like I don't, I don't want a combination of three or four of those guys. The way I look at it is this, like if you're fading quarterbacks in one quarterback league, right, there's still a tipping point where you come to this tier of quarterbacks where you're, you're comfortable starting the last guy, right? Like say you look at a, a group of rankings, there might be a tipping point where you get to quarterback 18, right? You get to quarterback 18 and you say, this is the last guy I feel comfortable starting starting in my lineup in a one quarterback league right and that might be off the top of my head maybe like Kirk Cousins at quarterback 18 right and you're like anyone that's ranked below him I don't feel comfortable starting in my quarterback slot so you make sure that you get that you draft Kirk Cousins or someone ranked ahead of him. I think of the same way in Superflex, the same way in Superflex, except whoever you feel is the least viable starter, but still a viable starter for you, you want to get him or someone above him plus someone that's already above him, okay? So he's like your last viable starter. The same way you look at quarterback 18 in a one quarterback league, that should be your quarterback two for a Superflex league, right? So you want to get Kirk Cousins plus the quarterback nine or the quarterback 12 or the quarterback 15. And the reason I do quantity, I say quantity over quality is because when you get to the mid-tier quarterbacks, what separates them on a points per game basis is so, so minimal. It's year over year. Like the quarterback seven to quarterback 17 or 18 discrepancy in terms of fantasy points per game is usually like 1.7 points per game over the course of the year. So why jump up? Why take a quarterback three or four spots earlier in the draft when you can get a quarterback four spots later, that's going to give you 1.5 points per game fewer, right? Like the difference between quarterback eight and 18 is not big. So why spend the capital on quarterback nine, 11, and 13 when you could spend the capital on quarterback 13, 14, and 17, right? A lot less pricey, but probably going to put you up the same production. So it's quantity over quality in super flex leagues for me, but the quality, there has to be like a reasonable quality metric there, if you know what I'm saying. So that's the way I'm going to be attacking super flex leagues. And I think like the least viable starter option makes sense when you say it out loud or when you start to think about like what actually goes into that process. The other thing I will touch on though is the league size that matters the smaller your league is the more you can fade quarterback or the more you could let quarterbacks fall in your league because you'll have more options and you'll be able to get them later if you're playing in a 14 or 16 team league it's really 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 important that you get two starting quarterbacks you might want to use your first two picks on them you might even want to use your first three picks on them or something like that but make sure you come away with the first three rounds probably with two quarterbacks because they're going to go off the board very quickly and obviously if you're in a 14 or if you're in a 16 team league at the very maximum everyone's going to have two nfl starting quarterbacks and that's not going to be the case because someone's going to grab three and someone's literally not going to have someone to play in their super flex spot so the bigger the league the more value that the quarterback position in itself has okay so that is the overall strategy portion of it i hope that was helpful to get inside the brain of my fucked up head. If you want to go really deep, like the way I just kind of laid that out for you guys, I do that for every position, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end in the draft guide. And thanks to monkeyknifefight.com who is sponsoring the draft guide. All you got to do is go on monkeyknifefight.com to get our draft guide for $10, literally $10. You're getting the season long draft guide, which has the Bible, which I've been talking about for every single position, a breakdown, very thorough, very narrow, like I just did along with the rookie dynasty kit. You might not play in a dynasty league, but it's got all the info you need on rookies, their prospect profiles, what can, what we can expect from them in 2020, as well as Dr. Morse's complete injury guide. So any guys that are coming into the year with a little bit of an injury designation, we've got the write up. We've got real context. We've got doctors who know the injuries and can tell you what the timetables are. So we've got a whole shitload of information within the draft guide, rankings, printable draft day, cheat sheets. We've got our sleepers, undervalued, overvalued, do not draft list, all that shit. So if you head over to monkeyknifefight.com, you deposit $10 or more using the promo code BDGE. Make sure that if you're a first-time depositor, you use the promo code BDGE. You play a game of $2 on their site, okay? Once you play the game of $2 on their site, they will email me, letting me know that you did it, and then I'll email you with instructions to access to the draft guide. It is the single best value in fantasy football right now, but let's talk about some values at quarterback. Now, I know I said I was fading the mid-range of the quarterback position, and I probably still will do that, but if there's one guy I will be targeting this year, it is Carson Wentz of the Philadelphia Eagles. If you look back just a couple of years ago, Wentz was like that elite climbing quarterback that we thought was going to stay in that top range of fantasy quarterbacks. Back to 2017, he finished as the quarterback three over the last five years that quarterback three finish would have been good for quarterback two in every one of those years in 2015 he only would have trailed cam newton in 2016 only aaron Rodgers. in 2018 only patrick mahomes last year only lamar jackson and this is a stat i got from the roto underworld podcast from matt kelly which is insane carson wentz is the first quarterback ever 
ever to throw for 4,000 yards in a season where there was no wide receiver that went over 500 yards. Like, put that in perspective, how hard that is to do. That's like a running back running for 12 or 1,300 yards with the dead last ranked offensive line. Or flip it, it's like a wide receiver going for 1,000 yards when his quarterback threw for 2,800 yards or something like that. Like, it just tells you how good this guy was despite the shit show that was surrounding him. I truly, truly, they've been trying so hard to get this deep threat on the outside. And I forget, someone put up a, a great video on Twitter the other day explaining how big the addition of Jalen Rager to this offense is going to be. They've been trying so hard to get that deep threat to unlock this offense, whether it was Mike Wallace or whether it was Deshaun Jackson. I don't even know if Mike Wallace is actually on their team. I might have just made that up, but they've wanted Deshaun Jackson to be this thing. And I really think Wentz was in for a monster year. Same with Deshaun Jackson last year. Had he stayed healthy, eight for 154 and two touchdowns in that first game. Like they were going to make beautiful, beautiful babies together. By midseason, Greg Ward became the wide receiver one in Philadelphia. Now we have two legitimate field stretchers and really good wide receivers, Deshaun Jackson and Jalen Rager. You have Dallas Goddard and you have Zach Ertz. So Goddard's dealing with this hairline fracture in his hand. He's supposed to be fine by like next week. And you have Miles Sanders in the backfield. Yes, Miles Sanders dealing with the leg injury. We still don't know any seriousness of it. We don't even know what it is, but they say it's not serious. We'll have to monitor reports on that. The other thing though, from the passing game, if Miles Sanders somehow misses time or gets re-injured or something like that, that's going to be more passing work for Carson Wentz. They're not going to run the ball at a high rate and they're going to use Boston Scott in the passing game. Like, no matter which way you turn the pieces, it's wheels up for Carson Wentz this year. And the last thing I think we should note about Carson Wentz is like his underrated athleticism. And this is a tweet that I tweet out yearly and I try to update the thread. Of the 18 quarterbacks that have finished as a top three fantasy quarterback over the last six years, 12 of them, so 67% of them had at least three rushing touchdowns. The average was four and a half. Of the remaining six, Four of them rushed for at least 265 yards that season. So only two of the top three fantasy quarterbacks over the last six years. So two of the 18 quarterbacks didn't have at least three rushing touchdowns or 265 plus rushing yards. So you need to have that at minimum to be in that top three fantasy discussion. And in 2017, Wentz ran for 299 yards in 13 games. It is right there. The ceiling is very real for Wentz. If he could do what he did last year with almost no weapons, no downfield weapons. Like, yes, yeah, Sanders is good. Ertz is good. Goddard's good. Greg Ward is good. All those guys' average depth of targets were like three yards in front of the line of scrimmage. Now he's got people to actually throw the ball to downfield. That's going to be all the difference maker that he needs in terms of his passing yardage production. So if there's a mid-round guy I'm targeting, it is Carson Wentz. Now, if you're in the middle rounds of your draft... Guess what? That means you're actually drafting. That means your fantasy football league is happening, okay? And if you are drafting, if you're drafting with your friends or your coworkers, whoever it is, and you got a physical draft going on, you want something on the line. You want a damn Lombardi trophy, okay? And the number one place to get that is at draftnowfantasy.com. Draftnowfantasy.com has got a fantastic kit, Fantastico. Comes with the Lombardi trophy, comes with the sash, so you can give that to your loser for next year's draft. And it comes with the beautiful board. Again, this thing is huge. It's beautiful. It's matte black. I can't open it up because it would take up too much of the screen, but it is 20 rounds. It is 14 teams, and that 20 rounds is perfect because, as we suggested, if you're doing a draft this year, make sure you extend the rosters because we're going to have a lot of COVID IR players. So this is perfect for that. It's got 20 rounds. It's got all the player stickers that come with it. It's got the Lombardi trophy. It's got the sash. It's the pristine, perfect kit for your draft on Draft Now Fantasy. Dot com. It is $70 for the kit. It might be like $67 or some shit for the kit. But when you use the promo code BDGE, BDGE, you're getting 10% off plus free shipping. So that 70 comes down to 60 divided by 12 people in your league. And guess what? It is $5 a person. Get everyone to throw in $5 on top of the 50 or $100 buy-in. And now you got a trophy. Now you got a draft board, you got the player stickers, you got the loser sash. That's it, baby. DraftNowFantasy.com. Use the promo code BDGE and you will not regret it. I promise you, if you're a commish, you'll be looking like a fucking Don. If you're a league member, your commish will very much appreciate you throwing the words to him. DraftNowFantasy.com. Promo code BDGE. For the most part, the rest of the guys we're going to break down in this video are more for y'all super flex guys. Or, you know, maybe if you're in a one quarterback league, a deeper league, or just want to have a second quarterback on your roster that has high upside, these are these guys you should be targeting as your quarterback two, as your quarterback threes. First off, we got Joey Burrow, the number one overall pick coming out of LSU last year, threw for 5,671 yards and 60, 60 passing touchdowns, a completion percentage of 76.3%, 10.8 yards per attempt. This man just rewrote the record books last year. It's not often you see this number one quarterback pick go into a situation like they will with Cincinnati. Like not only do they get Jonah Williams back on that offensive line, which makes everybody better on the offensive line, 
line. But he's got a ground game with Joe Mixon. He's got pass catchers with Joe Mixon, Gio Bernard, John Ross, Tyler Boyd, A.J. Green. And if you want to throw T. Higgins in there, obviously there are some health situations going on between Higgins, Green, and John Ross. But realistically, outside of Boyd, we just need like one or two of those guys to stay healthy. Auden Tate is more than good enough to supplement as a third wide receiver, especially someone in the red zone. And if we start looking at some things from people on Twitter that are way smarter than me, you just look at what he did last year. Joey Burrow's accuracy rating was out of control. Deadly accurate on short throws on intermediate throws and on deep throws literally putting the butter in the bread basket another tweet straight from brett coleman one of the uh, best film breakdown guys on youtube right now make sure you subscribe to brett among all 17 draftable quarterbacks in this class their average passer rating under pressure was 80 Point three, And their average drop in passer rating from no pressure to under pressure was negative 30.2. Burrow is the only quarterback whose rating went up under pressure from 137.4 to 143.2. Going off the rushing accolades, Joey Burrow is a very good athlete. He's rushed for over 350 yards in each of the past two seasons and has 12 rushing scores over those last two years. This dude is going to give you a really, really nice floor on the ground as well. That's like an extra one and a half to two fantasy points per game right there. And that's the difference between quarterback 20 and quarterback 12 or quarterback 17 and quarterback seven like Joey Burrow's leap is ready to be made right now 10 years ago the idea of a rookie quarterback throwing for more than 4,000 yards seemed a little bit absurd but not anymore man Burrow's probably going to flirt with that line given the likelihood of the Bengals and what their trailing rate is probably going to be this year he's going to have a lot of volume a lot of pass attempts the volume in the passing game should be enormous they were a team that ran the single most plays the single most plays in the NFL last year while trailing 495 Burrow's going to be like Aaron Rodgers light in a sense Burrow's someone that's probably statistically fantasy wise going to throw up a lot of the same number at the quarterback like 10 through 16 is going to that you can draft later on than those guys so we love Joe Burrow I love Derek Carr man I talked about yesterday a little bit on the show I just think Derek Carr is such a sum of his parts quarterback man and once you're getting to these mid-tier guys once you're getting to the guys who are the quarterback like eight through 20 what's going to separate them is probably their supporting cast what the team around him can add to his game and when you look back at last year when you look at what Derek Carr did 4,055 passing yards was eighth in the NFL. Number nine in overall red zone attempts. Most importantly, protection rate. Protection rate. Number one in the NFL. His offensive line blocked for him like he was their newborn child, okay? The sum of his parts. What I mean by that, you have the holy trinity here. The offensive line, the running game, and the weapons. He's got all three. There's no holes in this offense outside of what you would probably call Derek Carr. Now, Derek Carr was deadly accurate last year. Second in true completion percentage, third in play action completion percentage, number five in clean pocket completion percentage, which is huge when you have the number one offensive line pass blocking for you. Accuracy rating, number three overall, number 10 in adjusted yards per attempt. Really, in most statistical categories, when it comes to accuracy, Drew Brees was the only NFL quarterback last year that was more accurate. Of course, that comes at the expense of deep balls taking shots, but Jay Gruden's come out and said he wants Derek Carr to take more shots down the field this year. And Derek Carr is not a guy who is inaccurate down the field. Like He is ranked very highly in terms of deep ball completion percentage or deep ball accuracy percentage, I should say, per PFF when he is throwing the ball deep. So the volume is not there, but on a smaller sample size, when he does throw it down the field, he does it well. And the weapons that they bring in, the weapons that they have on the team, right? Again, you have the offensive line, which is extremely underrated. You have Josh Jacobs, who's going to be a workhorse there this year. You have a ton of pass catching backs who's going to raise the floor of Derek Carr's passing numbers. You have Derek Carr being accurate last year. What he needs to do is just be accurate around the line of scrimmage because now you add a guy like Henry Ruggs who can take a slant to the house because he's got ridiculous blazing speed. We don't need Henry Ruggs to be Deshaun Jackson down the field and Derek Carr to hit him on a 60-yard Hail Mary. We just need to hit him on a slant, and that's what Derek Carr does best. So you hit Henry Ruggs on a slant, and this guy's going to lead all rookies in yards after catch. You have Darren Waller, an explosive tight end down the field. You have Hunter Renfro, who had a really good chemistry with Derek Carr down the stretch last season. You have Tyrell Williams, who's a good downfield playmaker if he could stay on the field. You have Brian Edwards, who is a good possession receiver, who Derek Carr compared to Devontae Adams already. Like Everything is lining up for Derek Carr to have a career season and it's not going to surprise me when he finishes easily top eight again in passing yards he'll probably flirt with 42 to 4400 passing yards I would say 25 passing touchdowns and doing it in a very efficient manner I think there's a ceiling but more importantly I think there's a really high floor for someone that you could draft at like quarterback 25 so I love Derek Carr I'm drafting him everywhere in every best ball draft I have he's probably my most high owned quarterback right now Derek Carr can't believe I'm fucking saying this out loud, but he is a must-own quarterback in 2020 fantasy football. And so is Gardner, Gardner, Garter, Mustache, Minshew. Who would name their kid Gardner? That's such a weird fucking name to name somebody. We're going to name him Gardner.
honey, what'd, uh, what'd you do this morning? I, I, I gardened a little bit. It was fun. I had a good time. Uh, you know, it's something I love to do. And I love my son. So we're going to name him Gardner. So by all uh, intents and purposes, like Gardner Minshew was awesome as a rookie last year. Of course, he has his ups and downs. I mean, he's a six round rookie pick who was thrown into the fire out of nowhere. 21 to six touchdown to interception ratio. If your team had a quarterback that did that in their rookie season, you would be hyped. But because he was a six round pick, because he's a little questionable in terms of like his wild personality, people are wilding out on him and they're just like, eh, I don't know about Gardner Minshew. He's not that accurate. We don't love him. 21 to six touchdown to interception ratio. Shut your mouth. Set franchise records for a rookie in passing yards, 32, 71. And those touchdown passes, 21 was a franchise record. What I love, what I love is this underrated ground game for Gardner Minshew, 344 yards on the ground, zero rushing touchdowns. Why does that get me excited? Among quarterbacks that ranked fifth, 344 rushing yards ranked fifth among quarterbacks last year of the quarterbacks that ranked above him one they all played in more games than he did two they finished with at least four rushing touchdowns they had seven four nine and seven Gardner had the yardage he was the only one that finished with fewer than four rushing touchdowns he had zero so for the discrepancies in what he might do in terms of like pulling back this year with passing touchdowns and passing yardage and efficiency, he's going to make up for with rushing scores. I love the fact that we have a true number one now in DJ Chark, dishing Justice Chark, and now we have LaVisca Chenault coming in. So he has a great line of scrimmage wide receiver too that can make plays for him and go up and get some yak for him. We need, quarterbacks need that yak action. They need the yak action in order to hit their ceiling and assume their ceiling. So we've got the yak. We've got the deep balls. But I don't think people realize how good of a deep ball thrower he he was last year he was the single highest graded deep ball thrower per pff last year deadly accurate like he doesn't have the arm that you want to see he doesn't have like the patrick mahomes cannon but i'll tell you what's far more important than being able to throw the ball 60 yards down the field 80 yards down the field it's being accurate on 80 percent of your passes downfield put it in the basket for dj chark to grab it and continue running with the ball being accurate 20 30 yards down the field is so much more important than physically being able to throw it 40, 50 yards down the field. 99% of passes in the NFL don't go 40, 45, 50 yards down the field. So I'm not worried about his arm strength. I'm way more concerned with accuracy. And he showed that he had it last year. Fifth highest completion percentage on deep balls last year, 45.1%. He did not have a single turnover worthy throw on deep balls last year per PFF. We're not going to sugarcoat it. Jacksonville is going to be a shit team. Four and a half win total per Vegas. They don't have a backup quarterback that we have to worry about Minshew getting benched for. The volume is going to be there. He might put up a Jameis Winston type year where he ends up throwing 30 touchdowns with 20 interceptions, but he's going to get 700 pass attempts this year because they're going to be trailing and they're always going to be in comeback mode. The offensive line, we've heard that they have to be better this year, which is not a fact. That's just an assumption because there's usually offensive lines or groups of people perform poorly because they're usually just bad, right? So that doesn't mean that everyone that's bad is going to improve. Bad people can get worse. Bad people can stay stagnant. There's a good chance that the offensive line is still absolute shite this year in Jacksonville. However, however, Minshew had 10 touchdown passes while under pressure last year. That was tied for the NFL lead with Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, Carson Wentz, and can't be biased here, Sam Darnold. I mean, he was under pressure at the highest single rate of all NFL quarterbacks last year, so that could be why. Basically, every time he threw the ball, he was under pressure, so any touchdown passes he had, we're going to count towards that category, but good company all around. So Gardner Minshew, as your quarterback two or three in Superflex, or even your quarterback one that I guarantee you will be picked up off most waivers this year in those types of leagues, he's must own. He's must own. When it comes down to it, that's 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 what this video is about. We had the people asked for the quarterback stuff. We hadn't had enough analysis on it, and now you have it. Well, there you go. That's the video for today. If you want more of this, if you want a much more in-depth breakdown, you know, I, I know it's hard to believe that we can go even more in-depth. But this was just skinning the surface. You got to go cop the draft guide through monkeyknifefight.com. Deposit $10 on monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you do so and play a game of $2 on their site. They'll email me and I'll email you access to the draft guides and you'll be able to read up and you never have to watch a video of mine again. Make sure that if you enjoyed this video, all we ask is that you hit that thumbs up button. You scroll down and there's a little button that looks like that and one that looks like that. I would really appreciate it if you, you fucking click that one, not that one. And then subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're doing fantasy football stuff every single day for the rest of our lives.
and put the notification bell on. I don't even know how to do that, but apparently people say that, and I feel like I should say it. That's all we got for you today. I will see you all tomorrow on Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's Dynasty Show, but we've been doing a lot of redraft stuff this month of August. But thank you for joining me. Peace.